Hey guys, my name is Stephen Lowe, and I am the author of the book Overcoming Gravity, A Systematic Approach to Gymnastics and Bodyweight Strength. Today we'll be going over the fundamental knowledge base, so part one, and then in this specific video, chapter three, which goes over the progression charts that you may have seen out there, and the level system, and how to classify beginners, intermediates, advanced, and so on. And then also on setting and achieving goals and how to commit to achievement. All right, so the progression charts in Overcoming Gravity were mainly based off of the Federation International of Gymnastics, in, in short, FIG, uh, Men's Artistic Gymnastics, in short, MAG, uh, and the CODA points, uh, the COP for the 2008 to 2012 quadrennium. They've had these uh, specific difficulty charts in gymnastics uh, since probably the 60s or 70s. Um, may have gone back further, but um, they were only online specifically uh, around the turn of the century, uh, around 2000s, I think, uh, at least widely accessible. And so uh, when I was looking through them towards skills I wanted to learn in gymnastics, I found that, okay, there's a lot of actual um, progressions you can use from these to learn uh, harder skills. And then also in terms of the context of um, working towards harder strength moves, there's actually a lot of intermediates between them you can use as well. Um, so uh, I was probably one of the first to look at these in terms of a classification type system or uh, RPG like system where you could uh, work down the list of progressions and level up your abilities quote unquote and uh, the fact that there's like gaps in the progressions uh, means you may need some intermediates to work on them and so uh, I'll, I'll provide the link in the comments below a uh, link to the overcoming gravity charts online on the Google Docs um, below is the picture of an example of the pulling chart uh, which will go through uh, a couple of the progressions now. So this is the zoomed in pulling chart. And as you can see, on the left side of the chart, you have your green, blue, orange, and your red for elite. So beginner, intermediate, advanced, and elite. And the fig level for these exercises is approximately uh, your basic skills, your A level skills, your B level skills, and C. So those of you who are familiar with gymnastics, you'll know that the difficulty rating system actually goes up past um, C to D, E, and then in the 2010s plus, they've gone to even greater scaling. So now they're up to um, from E, F, G, and I think they're up to maybe I or J skills. So there's uh, a lot of difficulty increase beyond just uh, the basic skills to C-level skills. But um, for most of us who are, are kind of working on getting stronger with the common uh, bodyweight progressions, I wanted to just make a, make sure that it's more applicable to the your common person uh, rather than gymnastics who are training, you know, 10, 15, 20 years for the strength movements. And also they probably have some genetics and other uh, quantifiers unquantifiable factors that get them towards elite level strength compared to the rest of us. Um, so that's why um, things are classified mainly up to sea level. I figure if you're working uh, sea level skills, which are mainly like your very difficult things like planche on the rings, or even harder with like Maltese where you're in uh, kind of the upside down Y position on rings, holding yourself flat. Um, that is, that's a, a D move in the uh, fig mag code of points. And so if you're working those types of skills, they're probably beyond the level of which most of us are probably going to get to in our lifetimes. Um, but as you can see uh, on the chart I have here on the screen, we have your different columns and you can see uh, one, two, three, and um, the book page number on where the specific progressions for these are. So um, the three I wanted to look at were the back lever, the front lever, and the front lever rows. And as you can see with the back lever, there's a lot of basic skills. Um, the uh, full back lever in terms of gymnastics difficulty is actually an A-level skill and probably closer to one of the easier ones. So 
Um, it's rated about um, around level six, seven ish range. And um, in particular, for uh, this part of the chart, the gray ones are prerequisites I'd recommend for iron cross training, uh, just to make sure you're building up your shoulder and your elbow connective tissue to be prepared for that, and so you don't get overuse injuries like tendon injury. Um, but in general, uh, the German hang is one of the first um, types of things you learn, German hang um, being the top image up on the right side, and then I, the skin the cat is basically a pullout from German hang to uh, being inverted on the rings. And then as you can see, uh, the progressions, as we covered, uh, the center mass of the body gets further and further from the shoulders, which means it gets harder and harder uh, as more torque is required at the shoulder in order to do the skill. So you have your tuck progression, uh, your advanced tuck where the legs are out and the hips are at 90 and the knees are about 90 degrees. Then uh, the straddle and then the half layout or one leg out. I only showed the half layout here and then full back lever. Um, there are some harder progressions for those like uh, the back lever pull out. So you go from back lever and pull yourself up to inverted hang. So as you're doing a concentric movement rather than an isometric, it's harder than that. And then you can even go from the um, German hang all the way, pull straight body up to inverted hang. Um, so there are harder variations of these as you get stronger. Um, as you can see, um, generally, most people acquire the strength to get front lever after back lever because back lever is a bit easier as long as you're practicing both at the same time. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind in the charts uh, is that if you're practicing each of them at the same time, then some are going to be harder than others. So a, a lot of people you see in getting into calisthenics um, may have a climbing background or like lifting background and they'll get front lever first but that's because there's a lot of transference from some particular exercises to the front lever um, compared to back lever which is a more awkward position but if you had been training them from the beginning uh, back lever is actually easier than front lever because the uh, the lats and chest are at a bit better leverage uh, for the specific specific movement and so they're easier if you had the same amount of practice with both um, and as you can see uh, with the front lever with the hands in front of you holding yourself out flat um, the row movement where you pull and try to get the bar or rings to your chest or hips area is going to be harder than the actual hold as well since it's a concentric movement so that's the charts and then i'll explain a little bit more on the next page um, so on this slide, uh, basically, as I explained before, uh, we have your beginner, intermediate, advanced, and elite. And so um, in general, uh, beginner range is a bit broader. Um, as you can see, there's five squares as opposed to four for intermediate, advanced, and then three for elite. Um, what I did there was I tried to make sure that um, since most gains come quicker in the beginning as a beginner, you're going to be able to progress a bit faster. And so uh, when you see that in terms of the charts, uh, generally speaking, most people will be able to progress faster in the beginning. So that's why there is a specific larger uh, beginner size, and it doesn't correlate specifically with the basic uh, A, B, and C skills. Um, additionally, the charts were made for your general average male, so about 5'9", maybe plus or minus an inch or two, and maybe about 150 to 160 pounds, plus or minus about 10 pounds. Um, so for metric, you guys can convert that. I think it's like 175 centimeters and maybe 70 kilograms or so, uh, plus or minus a few kilograms. Um, basically, the charts are built for somebody who is relatively average, and of course, if somebody is shorter and lighter or taller and heavier, then things are obviously going to be uh, harder or easier uh, in terms of doing those skills. So, um, so for so like gymnasts who are usually shorter and lighter on average, um, your average uh, male elite rings gymnast is probably going to be about in the five two to five seven range, and in the hundred ten. Uh, pounds to maybe 130, 140 pounds uh, range max. And so obviously, if you're smaller and shorter, you're going to have a better strength to body weight ratio compared to somebody who is taller. So um, if you are taller and heavier than the normal, it's likely that you're going to be 
progressing slower, and so that should not be a surprise. Um, a lot of people are confused about the charts in terms of like how fast they're progressing, but um, if you are taller and heavier, it, you will progress slower, and things may be harder for you than somebody who is uh, shorter and lighter. Um, additionally, uh, with women in general, since women um, tend to have less muscle mass on average, um, I, I think they've they, they've done studies on women and untrained uh, women and untrained men, and untrained women have about sixty seven percent of the lower body strength as men, and about fifty percent of the upper body strength as men. So, um, women can learn a lot of the skills. Um, it's just going to be harder since they're starting from a lower average point. And so um, there, there are women who have gotten to, you know, full front lever, full back lever, but it is going to be in general harder since it's harder for women to add muscle mass and strength, um, both starting from a lower point and from uh, things like testosterone as well. Um, additionally, there are pushing and pulling and legs uh, disparities. So, um, for example, uh, with a lot of climbers, I've seen that they're pretty close to a one-arm chin up which is about level eight or nine on the charts, um, whereas some can't even do hips when they're uh, put up to it, which is about level three or four on the charts. So um, in terms of like doing your sport, it's common that people may not necessarily ha be uh, balanced in terms of their pushing and pulling exercises. Um, that's not a big deal. Um, imbalances don't cause injuries, um, although they can be a risk factor for injuries. Um, for example, uh, baseball pitchers, very imbalanced because they're throwing with one arm all the time, and uh, their body is set up to throw with one arm and not the other, and so they have a lot of muscle imbalances, quote-unquote, in their body, but that does not necessarily mean they'll be injured. Um, usually it's going to be like the overuse aspect or not being uh, prepared for the forces that you're putting on your body or getting back uh, from rehab to doing professional sports too quick. So th those are the main factors. Um, imbalances generally don't cause any injuries, but if you wanted to be relatively quote unquote balanced and get your pushing and pulling relatively similar, uh, that is always a good thing to strive for and uh, may help to prevent uh, injuries in some cases. Um, you really don't know who it is who is going to have uh, injuries because of the potential uh, risk factor for imbalance. So you can't claim somebody something caused injuries, but you can understand it from the context of uh, there could be a potential risk factor there, uh, but uh, it's not always the case that somebody is going to have an injury. All right, so setting and achieving goals. This is one of the common things where people kind of get stuck with the uh, in in the book because they don't know what kind of goals to make or what to do with them once they've got them. So uh, basically, for most people, in terms of setting goals, you want to set your long-term goals. So this is usually the things that people most want to achieve when they uh, get into bodyweight training and see different people do different skills. So uh, commonly, they're the, the front lever, the handstand, handstand push-ups, uh, being able to do one-arm chin-ups. And you can think of these as your long-term goals, whereas the um, various progression intermediates, um, so like for back lever, you have your tuck, your advanced tuck, your straddle, your one leg out. Those are your shorter um steps and sh your short-term goals that you should use. Um, so you want to refine your goals measurably and with those, um, for example, uh, a 10 second front lever or three handstand push-ups, those are some of the common ones that you want to do and in general you want to refine those in a smart manner, so specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and time-bound. Um, so for like front lever, you could say specifically and measurably you want to get a, about a 10 second front lever and you're going to break it into the specific progressions to work on them and then uh, realistic and time bound um, generally you can progress through some of the uh, intermediates towards front lever usually within uh, a cycle so six a few weeks uh, to a few months or uh, several cycles, uh, usually uh, one to three cycles you can use to progress through the intermediates to work towards that. So 
Um, you're going to break them into the smaller goals and um, progress them up over time until you get to your main goal. Um, and specifically, there is a Harvard study I included in the book um, where those who had written down their goals versus those who had goals but didn't write them down versus those who had no goals. Um, those who had no goals achieved, let's say, 100% of their uh, ability to set goals. So like they were successful 100%, but those who had goals but didn't write them down were successful up to 200% of the 100. So they were basically doubly as successful. Um, whereas those who had written them down and actively strived for them, they had over 10 times as much success as those who had no goals. So um, it is important to get these written down and uh, measurably acted upon, uh, which is what this specific chapter is teaching you to do. Um, now, there is some specific criticism of SMART goals. Um, working towards goals in particular can be a bit nebulous for some people, but it's best to think in terms of SMART goals as helping you build the habits that will make you successful. Um, so, for example, um, having your short-term goals is what is going to uh, be able to help you to construct a routine, and this routine is supposed to become a habit in your daily and weekly life, such that you're work doing workouts progressively and consistently to work towards those goals. And so um, once you have those habits set up, that is what is going to be able to get you to those goals. Uh, it's, it's the habits that you're establishing that is going to build the consistent nature in order to get you there. So um, you may have heard the phrase that the, the best routine is the one you stick to, and there is some truth in that. Um, there's no quote unquote, optimal routine for a beginner. Um, there are routines that work um, fairly effectively for a lot of the populations. And then uh, there is some variation in there, but you do want to get in the habit of being consistent with exercise, which is what is going to get you towards your goals in the long term. Um, in general, once you have your goals, um, generally you want to um, find them into specific body groups. Um, so the, the common ones I use are your upper body push, your upper body pull, uh, your legs and your core, and uh, potentially others uh, such as skills if you have a specific sport or um, you're working towards, say, handstand, and it's not working like shoulder strength and endurance. You're working mostly the balance at some point. So um, you can refine those into goals and work on one to two at a time. Um, a routine will usually allow for you to work uh, one to two different exercises. Um, as you move into like intermediate and advanced, you can generally work up to three-ish, sometimes four. Uh, but overall, uh, one to two is a good one to strive for. So you can have one exercise uh, fit your one goal and the other exercise fit another. Um, so for example, um, usually with uh, training, most people are aiming towards, say, your planche and your handstand push-ups. So one exercise can work towards planche, such as pseudo planche push-ups, and another exercise works towards handstand push-ups at that time. Um, so you don't necessarily have to work towards two. You can kind of double up on both. But usually in most cases with body exercises, um, not specifically uh, not specifically uh, going towards one specific goal is better in the long run. Um, so uh, what I mean by that is the last point, which is uh, to prioritize based on your goals that are important or based on expert experience on which confer the most benefits. So, um, for example, uh, one common thing a lot of people want to strive for is one arm push ups, but uh, training for one arm push ups is relatively inefficient, quote unquote, uh, because um, some exercises like your pseudo planche push ups, as you progress towards more lean in them, so Usually with a push-up, uh, your hands are located beneath your chest or your nipple area. Um, pseudo planche push-ups will move your hands down closer towards your hips over time, so you're doing almost um, a planche push-up. So as you move your hands towards your hips, the leverage decreases in for your uh, chest and your shoulders, and that means uh, and your triceps, and that means you're getting more and more force on your chest, your triceps, and your shoulders as you're doing the pseudo planche push up with your hands progressively moving towards your hips. And so, 
The pseudo plant push up in particular is very good at uh, gaining strength for planche, but it's also very good at gaining strength for one arm push ups as well. So, um, those who train the pseudo planche push up to where their hands are above their hips, most of them can just try a one arm push up in a straddle or even straight body position and get it without practicing. So, that is one of the um, one of the, I got one arm push up basically from training planche without having actually trained one arm push up. Um, so there are some overlap between uh, skills like that where some have better transference from um, training them to other skills than others. Um, so some of the common ones that are very beneficial to other ones are um, the one arm chin up progression um, benefits front lever and back lever a lot. Um, the front lever rows or front lever pull-ups as they're called where you're in a front lever position like a tuck or straddle and you're doing a row where you're pulling the bar the rings towards your hips uh, that is a good one that transfers over pretty well uh, from front lever not just good for front lever but also good for uh, things like one arm rows and also can help out uh, your one arm shins uh, the um Plant pseudo planche push ups are a common one that transfers over well to one arm push ups. And then, uh, depending on your goals, uh, dips and handstand push ups are usually the one or two that you tend to go towards. Um, I tend to recommend uh, starting off with dips for most beginners. And then, as you get to level four, five, six, you can move into the handstand progression. Um, the reason for that is not because uh, handstand push up progression is like super good to start at the beginning, but most people. They're also going to be training uh, handstands as a skill work or uh, to gain balance for their handstands against the wall in the routine. And so you already do have some handstand work. Uh, you don't necessarily need both the handstand work and the handstand push-up work at the same time. And you can build some basic strength with the dips, which is often considered um, one of the squats of the upper body. Um, so um, generally speaking, that's... Uh, the main points for setting and achieving goals, you want to break them down into, or you want to write down your goals, first of all, in terms of uh, what you want to be able to do in the future, then kind of categorize them into the upper body push, the upper body pull, your legs, your core, and your skill, and then use that framework in order to uh, build your routine in the future. Um, so we're going to end here and go into the next part of the series and uh, the next video.